So now we can look at the relationship between delta G, which is free energy, and temperature. So whether a reaction is spontaneous, some reactions are spontaneous at all temperatures. Some are only spontaneous at low, sometimes they're spontaneous at high. Some of them are never going to be spontaneous no matter what you do. So you have to look at the, this equation, right? So delta G, delta H minus T delta S. Okay, so we're looking at um, the signs of H and, and S here, pretty much. So let's think of one that you, you already know, um, melting of ice. So you have solid water and you're turning it into a liquid water. This process, in order to do that, delta H has to be positive, right? It's an endothermic process. You're going to absorb heat in that, in that process. And to go from a solid to a liquid, the entropy is increasing, or right? becoming more disordered. So both of these are positive. The sign of H and the sign of delta S are both positive. So under what conditions will delta G be negative, right? In order to have a spontaneous reaction, delta G has to be negative. So if this guy is positive and this guy is positive, um, it really depends on how positive each one of those things is. So the only thing, that, the only other variable you can really change is the temperature. So you can change the temperature here. So when does water, or when does ice melt under, you know, high temperatures or low temperatures? Obviously under high temperatures. And so and the idea is really um, delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. So well, if this is positive, in order to get delta G to be negative, this negative T delta S term has to be a lot bigger. You want to subtract a much bigger number, right? You're going to sub sorry, subtract a much bigger number, so this becomes more negative than this term. And so this is only going to happen under high temperatures. Remember, this temperature is in Kelvin, so it's always going to be positive. So there's four cases that we can really look at um, in terms of looking at the signs of delta H and delta S. So if this is the first one that we looked at, right? If they're both positive, if they're both positive, this is going to be spontaneous under high temperatures. So both positive, um, spontaneous at high temperatures, spawn at high T. If they're both negative, you can prove this too, it's going to be spontaneous at low T, at low temperatures. So if the signs are the same, then they're really, it's temperature dependent. If the signs are not the same, it's either going to be spontaneous all the time or non-spontaneous all the time. So then you just kind of have to think about what conditions favor a spontaneous reaction. If something is exothermic and it's increasing the amount of disorder, that favors a spontaneous reaction. So that's always going to be spontaneous. There's no conditions, there's no temperature um, at which that's going to be non-spontaneous. So think about what that looks like if delta G... Um, is delta H minus T delta S. If this is negative, delta H minus T delta S is positive. This is also a negative number. No matter what numbers you plug in there, no matter what the temperature is, it's always going to be a negative number. And the other one, whenever you have um, an, an endothermic reaction, so if delta H is positive and delta S is decreasing the amount of disorder, becoming more ordered, delta G will never be spontaneous. Delta G if this is positive and I'm subtracting out a negative number, this term becomes positive and delta G can only be positive, so it's non-spontaneous. So what we're going to do in this next problem is we're going to look at a bunch of different reactions. You're going to try to assign a delta H and a delta S. Sometimes they give you delta H. You have to look at delta S just like we did at the beginning of the chapter. Figure out which one of these cases you have and then figure out if it's spontaneous at all temperatures, spontaneous um, under low temperatures, only spontaneous at high temperatures, or if it will never be spontaneous. So you have to look at the signs of delta H and delta S. So if the signs are the same, it's, it's either low or high. So if they're both negative, then it's spontaneous at low temperatures. If they're both positive, it's spontaneous at high temperatures. If the signs are different, then you have to rationalize why that is. If it's an exothermic reaction, that's increasing the amount of disorder. Those things favor a spontaneous reaction, so it'll be spontaneous. If you have an endothermic process and it's increasing the amount of order or decreasing the amount of disorder, then it's going to be non-spontaneous at all temperatures. So let's do a couple of these. Um, let's see, so they give you the delta H here. They say delta H is negative. Okay, so it's an exothermic process. Now you have to figure out what delta S is. So is delta S going to be positive or negative? So here I have a solid and a gas, and I'm making gases. So just the solid going to the gas part, I know that delta S is going to be positive here. And so the signs are different, so it's either all or nothing. So then you have to think, is this, is this 
do these conditions favor a spontaneous process? It's exothermic and it's increasing the amount of disorder. So delta, um, delta G is going to be negative at all temperatures. So this is spontaneous at all temperatures. And the next one's a little tricky because they don't give you delta H and you have to think about it. So what's happening in this process is you, you are taking chlorine and you're breaking this bond and you get two chlorine atoms, radicals really. And um, it takes energy to break bonds. So if you're putting energy into this, that means delta H is gonna be positive. And then you can look at the sign of delta S. You're going from one gas to two gases so delta S is going to be positive there. And then you look at these, both of these signs are positive um, and the same sign, so we know it's temperature dependent. And since they're both positive, it's going to be spontaneous at high temperature. And you should kind of show this. When you assign the, del the delta S, show me that like on a quiz or on a test. That way I know if you... Um, you can get partial credit for that. So if you do this part right, but then you, you forget if it's spontaneous at all temperatures or whatever, um, you can at least get partial credit. I'll know where you where you went wrong. Was it because you didn't know how to assign delta S or was it because you didn't understand looking at the signs of H and S to figure out what, S, what G is? Um, for part C, they give you delta H is negative. And then you try to find the, the sign for delta S. We have three moles of gas going to one mole of gas. So delta S is going to be negative there. So since they're both negative, this is going to be spontaneous only at low temperatures. And the last one we have delta H is positive. So we want to find, find um, delta S. We have all gases again. So we have one going to two, one mole of gas going to two moles of gas. So delta S is going to be positive. So this will also be spontaneous at high temperatures. Uh, so notice there are four cases and you know we we didn't it, we didn't use them all so this was spontaneous at all temperatures we had two that were spontaneous at high and one that was spontaneous at low on a quiz or exam don't expect to have to use all four of them it, it it's it's it is whatever it is